And there are two further aspects or helps to prayer that we're going to talk about. And we are going to start with these two aspects. But as soon as we mention them, we almost have to give an apology or we have to defend ourselves because so many people in the church today think what I'm going to share with you is New Age or something that is occult. And uh, so they shy away from it. And you know what? We've given some of the special things that God has bestowed upon us and built into our very being, the way he put us together, and we've given that over to the enemy to use in these other ways. And we need to recapture it, learn how. So write in your notes. The first thing we're going to talk about is creative imagination. Now, uh, scientists tell us that uh, 60% of the people can see, actually, in their mind, can see pictures. I happen not to be in that 60%. I wish I was, but I can't, haven't up to this time. But many of you probably here tonight are. And so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think of a television program you watched recently or an event that took place in your life and try to see it. Can you see it? I mean, not just remember it. You remember it with your intellect. But can you actually see it as it was taking place, the colors of it, Uh, the expressions on the faces of the people, and so forth? Then, if so, you're in the category of those who are, are seers. This is a tremendous gift of God. He gave us a mind and a rational sense to use for his glory and in our walk with him, why then can't we use our imagination that he's given us, our creative imagination in the same way? God wants us to do that. How can we do that? Well, one of the things that's really rich is to take a portion of scripture and as you meditate on it, you read it like we've been learning how to do, then you begin to actually see yourself in the midst of that or you begin to see the people who are operating in that passage. Maybe it's Jesus and the disciples out on the, in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. I mean, what a beautiful picture. And many of you would be able to actually see that in your imagination. Maybe you'd be able to hear the calling back and forth. You'd be able to see the waves and feel the wind, and you'd be able to see the astonishment on their faces when they let down the, the you know, the net and catch this huge bunch of fish. That's one way. You use creative imagination. Another way is um, um, just picturing yourself in the presence of the Lord. Mike Bickle, in a book he wrote about the passion, it's called The Passion or My Passion, whatever. There, he pictures himself often in the throne room standing there with the elders and the archangels and and the seraphs and the crowd of people and the thunderous noise that comes as they praise the Lord. And he he sees himself on his knees. He sees himself raising his hands. He sees himself, you know, just shouting at the top of his voice, adulation unto the Lord. It really does something for his spirit. And he's able to use his creative imagination that way. Another... Uh, way you can do this is as you pray for people. Even though I don't see much, many times I at least imagine the light and love of Jesus' presence and healing power coming in and coursing through the life of a person, opening the windows of their soul, blowing out the dank, damp, damp air that's there, the stagnant, fetid you know, smell that's there, cleaning it out and filling it with the light of his presence. You know, I believe God responds to that. And I fall into this trap many times, and we probably all do, that we can be so absorbed in the problems that people have and the dispositional traits that we want to see change in their lives. So we're just praying and praying about, Lord, negative thing. Lord, change them. Lord, don't let them be like this anymore, Lord, and so on. And we almost can lock them in because all we're thinking of is we're crying out about the negative thing that's grabbed a hold of them, whereas 
as how about starting to see them as they would be when God touches them? When Jesus touches them. When they're released, they're able now to be free. They're healed. They're restored. They're kind. They're peaceful. <laughs> they're generous. You know? And just begin to believe God for that and actually, with the creative imagination we have, see them in that condition. The second thing is Christian meditation. You can write in your notes. And we've already touched this in our first session in the Enable segment. And uh, you've already read that little piece that Richard Foster wrote about, um, about being in the presence of God. And creative imagination, or, or the Christian meditation kind of grows out of time spent, that holy leisure that we talked about, the time when we quiet ourselves and get in the presence of God and we begin to meditate on him and fill our hearts and our minds with his thoughts and, 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 under, and his understandings. And this is down through the history of the church. The pietistic people, the ones who have been able to, to walk in this and slow themselves down and get in the presence of God, the rewards in their life have been so rich. And why is it that we should give this over to the Eastern religions or to transcendental meditation or cults? And yet, when you start talking about meditation today, many people say, oh, you get it. That's, that's cult. Don't do that. No, this is what God has called his people to do, to get in the presence of him. But look over here at this chart with me, and you can fill this in in your notes as we go along. Actually, there's a vast difference between Eastern meditation or cultic meditation and Christian meditation. The Eastern meditation, the goal of philosophy is to empty your mind just as much as you possibly can. Empty your, uh, your own personality con, uh, traits and everything. Just lay them aside and, and empty your mind. Whereas the Christian view is to quiet your mind. To bring your mind, not empty it, but to bring it down, quiet, quiet it down so that all of the hustle and bustle of life be laid aside for a time and you can get quiet before the Lord. Eastern meditation goal is to detach from everything of substance. From you, yourself, your family, everybody else, this world, into the nothingness. The goal of Christian meditation is to attach. Attach yourself to Jesus. Quiet yourself, lay aside the hustle and bustle, and now begin to really see him as he is. To be really attached to him. That old chorus that we used to, I was raised on, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full at his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's what Christian meditation is to accomplish in our life, is to bring us down to the point where now, we're more and more attached to Jesus, not detached from all reality, but attached to Jesus. Eastern meditation's final goal is nirvana. It's absorption into the nothing of the universe. Absorption into that big, undefined soul of the universe where we become one with everything else. Christian meditation, final goal is fellowship. Fellowship with the Lord. Fellowship that enriches our life. And you know what? Christian meditation doesn't withdraw us from the world. Christian meditation enables us to be what God has called us to be in the world. We get strengthened. We get directed. We get encouraged. We get helped. We fall more in love with Jesus as we spend time with him, meditating on him. So, these two kind of lead into what we, the main topic that we want to talk about t tonight, and that is, okay, as we meditate, as we use creative, medita creative imagination, this plays into our ability to hear the voice of God. 
And we need to know how to hear his voice. We need to know when he's speaking to us. We need to know what he wants to say to us. We need to know how we can respond. Now, you've started reading Herman Riffle's book. And so your chapter, your, your chapter that you was assigned for tonight is on hearing the voice of God. It's one of the excellent chapters in this book. I hope that already you got a real start to get a handle on it from what Herman Riffle said. And just to reiterate, he, he told us there that there are three basic sources of knowledge, right? There's the senses. We taste, smell, touch, feel, and see. And we can gain knowledge through the senses, okay? But not only is it the senses, but also there's the rational mind. And we gain knowledge through the rational mind. Now, the Western culture of which we're a part pretty much shuts the door right there. If you're going to really know anything, then it either has to come through your senses or through your rational mind. Now, much of this came down from one of the ancient philosophers and his disciples who took things further than what he did. His name was Aristotle. But there was another ancient philosopher who had a different idea. His name was Plato, and he said, no, no, there is another source of knowledge. Now, he wouldn't call it spiritual knowledge necessarily. He called it the realm of ideas and so on. But he said there's a whole other area, it's just as valid source of knowledge as what these other two are, senses, sensory and rational, rationalization. And surely that's where Jesus lived. Now, just stop and think of the path Jesus walked while he was here. And constantly, he was interfacing with his mind. Yes, of course. His senses were, you know, probably a lot more alert than any of ours are. But he also was in touch with angels and demons, Satan, God. He talked to the Father. He heard the voice of the Father. A whole world of spiritual reality, beings and knowledge and spiritual truth. And one of the things that I had to transition in my life from the education that I received, even the seminary and college education I received, I had to transition to be able to be open to the fact that there was spiritual knowledge that was just as real and just as valid. In page 54, Herman Riffle says that we're like that Western civilization, the Western mind, has beaten us up and laid, and laid us bare and, and taken our clothes and we're naked by the roadside like the, the, the parable was of the um, Samaritan who had gotten, you know, attacked and beaten up. And we're just really robbed. And we've got to put an end to that, and we've got to get back our inheritance and get back all that he wants us to understand. How many times in the Bible does it say, thus saith the Lord, or something like that? God spoke continually to his people in the word. He spoke in many different ways. Just take the Christmas story. We're going to be there pretty soon. Think about the Christmas story for a moment. What happened during that Christmas story? Way beyond rational knowledge, way beyond the ability of the senses to understand, <clears throat> there were angels, there were dreams and visions, there was literally the voice of God. Simeon had a word of knowledge. I mean, all of these supernatural, spiritual uh, dimensions came into the Christmas story. Everybody who's a Christian believes in the Christmas story. But for a lot of them, it's not an instructive story. It's a fairy tale. Oh, yeah, well, that happened back there. Oh, yeah, well, that was... Wasn't it a beautiful story about the birth of Jesus? But can that happen to me? Can an angel talk to me? Can I hear from God today? Huh? Never even think about it. We need to begin to learn to think about it. Because God will speak to us today... Just the same as he spoke back in those other days. Now, it says at the top of your next page, how is it that God will speak? And I want you to realize that, you know what? Communication is a two-way street. And uh, we've been telling you that 
we can have an audience with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords every day as we go into his presence and we get, take time with him. But it's not, his. the goal of that, as far as God's concerned, isn't simply that we would go and dump on him, nor is it that we go with our shopping list, but the, or we go with our, all of our needs and our prayer requests, but how about listening for a while? Did, did you ever think the Lord of the universe, my, who made us and is our Heavenly Father and has a goal and a purpose for our life and works that he wants us to walk in, good works he wants us to walk in, you ever think that he might have something he wants to say to us? And yet, for most Christians, prayer is basically a two-way, a one-way street. <clears throat> their opportunity to tell God what they want, what they need, but not their opportunity to hear from the Lord. We can hear from God in the same ways that people have from the very beginning. As God revealed himself in the scripture, so God's going to speak to us today. He won't speak to all of us in the same way. There'll be a difference. But we need to learn to hear his voice and recognize it as in the form in which it's going to come to us and then give a proper obedience to it. So write in your notes... How do we hear God speak today? First of all, through the scripture. I want to say that God will never give us something that is not in accordance with the principle and the spirit that he's already given in his word. This always is the final test. It has to be corroborated by God's word. The Holy Spirit will not communicate to us something that's contrary to God's word. However, Having said that, we have to realize that God has written the scripture and given us the scripture to show us his heart, his mind, the general principles that he has for our life. But whether I should go and buy that chair tomorrow at Myers is not in the scriptures. You will not find that any place. Whether or not you should give a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars to your daughter who is in need is not in the scriptures. There are general principles in the scriptures, but the specific way in which these principles are to be expressed, we have to hear from God for. Jesus knew what he was going to do when he came here to this earth. I mean, he and the Father had agreed back in eternity the general principles of what he's going to do, but you know what? He had to spend hours, nights with him, with the Father. Why? So that when he got up the next morning, he'd know exactly what the Father wanted him to do. Jesus said, I don't do anything, say anything, think anything, act in any way, but what I've seen the Father act, and what he's showed me, what he's told me. So we have to hear the word of God. Back in the book of Deuteronomy, it's in your notes there, there was a general principle that was laid out that if the people of Israel disobeyed God and sinned, then God would make the heavens like brass, the earth like iron. The, in other words, there'd be a terrible um, drought and famine would come and they'd really suffer if they didn't obey God and put him first. Never once throughout all the pages of the Old Testament was that principle that God had laid down put into action until 700 years later or more when Elijah stood before the wicked king Ahab, he took that principle, took that verse, and he said, today, that verse in his spirit, God said, today that verse, that principle is going to be put in effect. And he told Ahab, it's not going to rain until I say so. And then he skied out loud of there. 700 years before that word of God was put into realization. Now, why is that important? It's important for this reason. Because uh, we need to have God show us what he means and when he wants to do the various things that are in the scripture. There are people out there today who I believe are walking in a heresy. It's the name it, claim it bunch. If there's anything in the word, you put your finger on it. God said it, God has to do it. 
And so you stand in faith and you claim from the Lord, this has to be. In so many words, you're ordering God around. You're saying, okay, you committed yourself in your word, now you've got to back it up. What an arrogant thing to do. I mean, how's, how are we, puny little us, first of all, going to be able to interpret what God really meant by that? Secondly, that this would be the time that God wanted to do it, that the circumstances were such that he wanted to do it, that this is really going to bring forward his kingdom without first hearing from him and knowing that that is exactly what God wants. So, the scripture is one of the ways in which God speaks to us. We have to understand how God does that and how he uses the scripture in our lives. Now, the second thing you can write down there in your notes is dreams and visions. Dreams and visions are big in the scriptures. And in the book of Daniel, it tells us that God sends the dream. And actually, the scripture there that's referred to in Daniel is Daniel telling the king, great king Nebuchadnezzar, that God had given him this dream because God wanted him to know what was really in his heart. He wanted to expose the king's heart to him, and then he would know what was going to happen to him if he didn't do what, if he didn't change his ways. We would be so impoverished if we couldn't hear God's voice in dreams. And I know in my life there's been several instances where it's been really, really of God that he, he did speak to me. And uh, maybe another time we'll share some of that with you. But what I want to say to you is this, just so you'll have a little understanding of dreams and visions, that dreams are the elemental language. In other words, dreams are the speak to us, they reveal what's in our heart, and they speak in symbols, not in words. So when you dream something, 95% of the time, the person you're dreaming about, the situation you're dreaming about, isn't, that isn't real. It's what this stands for. It's what it symbolizes in your life. For instance, you may dream about a policeman, or you may dream about your pastor or something. Okay, you want to give careful attention to that dream, because these are authority figures that God has established and put in your life. And there may be something that you need to yield to or listen to or receive from them that God wants to bring into your life as authority, as an authority. Here here you are dreaming about you're in a woods and there's a forest fire and everything starts burning all around you and you try to get out the best you can. You run one way or another and it looks like every avenue is exhausted and you're trapped. And here comes somebody you know walking along through the fire and they're a very mild-going, easy-going person and they just come take you by the hand and they show you the way out. Now, what are you supposed to do? Bake a pie for that person and take it over the next day? (laughs) No. What is God saying to you? What God is saying to you is the part of you that's like them, which is not operating very well right now, needs to come and rescue you. You're going to burn yourself out. So you need to allow. You need to just settle down here. You need to allow the quiet part of you, the reserved part of you, to come to the fore and just leave, lead you out of this mess. That's the way God uses dreams in our life. <clears throat> and so, how, what should we do with our dreams? Well, Herman Riffle suggests three things. First of all, pay attention to them. How many of you remember your dreams? <laughs> Lots of times I have a dream... The next day at noon, I couldn't tell you what it was. So, pay attention to your dreams, and he says, secondly, write them down. You need to have a little flashlight, pad of paper, flashlight, or something by your bed. Just a couple of words will bring back that dream to you. And then you need to pray that God will give you understanding. Now, learning the language of dreams is slow work, and you will not be proficient for a long time. But if you work at it, you'll have a dimension in your life that you never would have 
any other way. And when you think you're proficient, avoid telling other people what their dreams are. I mean, until you've had a lot of experience and been validated and maybe you've had some classes, don't go running around telling them, oh, well, this is what your dream means, that's what your dream means. Let them find out for themselves from God. Let God speak to them through their dream. Okay? Now, the third, uh, third way that God speaks today, as he did in the past, is you can write in the top of the next page, an inner witness. Frequently, God speaks through that small inner voice, and we have to test this voice, and we have to come to recognize it. Many times, God is speaking, but we're not tuned in. You know, it's not that God isn't speaking. He's trying to, but we're so absor absorbed in everything, and we haven't gotten quiet enough before, and we haven't even learned how to hear his voice. My daughter, or, or when our babies were born, it was amazing to me that before they even had their eyes open, before they even could see us just coming into the room, they knew we were there. And they could, other people could be there, but they had identified our voice from the midst of all the other voices. They had learned to identify our voice. They had imprinted upon us. My daughter, uh, Carrie, was uh, at a summer project for her um, wildlife biology uh, major in South Carolina with um, quail. And one of the things that happened was this little orphan quail was imp to imprint, be imprinted on her. And it, began, it thought she was the mother. And it followed her all over the place. It was inseparable. It was just a riot. You know, and she'd feed it and take care of it and so on. It was totally imprinted on her. Didn't pay any attention to any other person but just her. You know, in the midst of all the competing voices and all the other things, we have to let the Holy Spirit imprint the voice of God in our heart. So we know what that voice is like as far as we're concerned. And then we have to learn to obey and follow that voice. There's one verse in the Colossians that says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. When it comes to this matter of hearing the voice of God, and is this what I should do? Is this what God's telling me to do? And so on. The general principle is this. Let peace be the umpire. Let peace be the one, be what settles it in your heart. Okay, yes, I really believe this is God. If there's conflict and stirring, then you're not ready to accept that this is God's voice and to follow it. There are other ways that God speaks too. And there are people who have been ministered to by angels. In our society, in our day and age, <clears throat> um, there are people who have been taken up out of their bodies and have, God has shown them things, either hell or heaven or things going on on this earth. There are all kinds of things that have happened. I could tell you story after story. Uh, God speaks to us through other people, through counselors, wise counselors. He speaks to us through words of prophecy and prophetic words. We're going to get into that in a couple of weeks. But there are many ways in which God speaks to us. And uh, blessed is the person and blessed is the church family who has come to the place where they're willing to stop trying to figure everything out for themselves and just get before God and say, and listen to what God has to say. I want to tell you that our particular church uh, was really blessed in this regard. <clears throat> in the old church, the Holy Spirit began to move in our congregation and people were beginning to manifest raising of hands. Other things were taking place. People were getting healed and so forth. And uh, we would uh, try to sing some worship courses and raise our hand. We'd get a lot of flack and everybody, you don't want to offend anybody, so you put your hands back down. You didn't know what to do. We were really having a spiritual schizophrenic attack. And... Due to a group of uh, some circum unusual circumstances, one of God's spokesmen of that hour 
whose name was Jamie Buckingham from Florida, was available, and he was coming to minister in our church. Now, this is the first outside, big-time, charismatic speaker that we had had. I was really pumped. And I picked him up at the airport, I remember, and uh, we got acquainted, and he got in the car, and on the way home, he said, Joe, he said, you know, I don't know what God wants me to say tonight. Oh, I thought... We got home, my wife had prepared a nice meal, we were eating the meal. In the middle of the meal, he said, you know what, I don't know what God wants me to say tonight. We got to church, and uh, there was a good, good group of people there, and I was sitting in the pew, and I introduced her, we had some opening worship, I introduced Jamie, and he got up and he said, folks, he said, I don't know what God wants to do tonight. I wanted to crawl under the pew, I <laughs> mean, just. And he said, well, let's ask God. Well, that's a new thought. I hadn't conducted my worship services that way before. So we got quiet for a little bit. And then all of a sudden he began to chuckle. Oh, so that's it. Okay. So then he began to preach this great sermon about the children of Israel at Mount Sinai and how, you know, the cloud began to move. And the trumpets blew and everybody pulled up their stakes uh, like the good old Israelites, many of them. They've been in there almost a year and they lengthened their stakes and started their little businesses and stuff. Wow, now they had to pull up their stakes and they had to move on. And he said, when the cloud moves, you have to move with it. Now, that night after he finished, there was a word of tongues and interpretation, the first one in our congregation. And it confirmed what he said. And then one of our deacons came up to me. He's sitting right here. And he said, God showed me something. Come on up here, Gary, and tell us what, what it was. This is Gary Wilson. Gary's been a, uh, holding the anchoring the art department at uh, Community College for years. <laughs> and a friend that we've walked with for a long time. Can you remember back to that night? Yeah, I can, although it's getting harder at my age. <laughs> when Joe asked me to do this a couple of weeks ago, and I said, Joe, you expect me to remember something like that? But I can. And I, because I can remember we were, we were at that point in time, we were learning how to listen to the voice of God, but we weren't very good at it. But uh, as Jamie spoke, I mean, I w we were praying. I had my eyes closed, and I'm a visual person because I, yeah, I just have always been visual. That's what I do. I teach art and all that. Um, and as... As I closed my eyes, I can remember seeing very clearly this cloud that was literally moving. And I saw, as it were, our congregation. And, and I saw that, that as the cloud moved, we moved with it. But then, all of a sudden, I took a double take in this little picture that's in my, my mind that I'm seeing. Because I noticed that there was a bunch of people that didn't move. They just were there. you know. But the cloud's over here, and these other people were sitting there. And I, and I said to myself, well, God... You know, what's this all about? And then the thought came to my mind as I'm looking at this picture. He said, well, the cloud is oxygen. It's the thing that gives life. And I said, well, then how come those people over there aren't, aren't following the cloud? And he says, because they're already dead. And that was the basic understanding that I had. So I shared that with Joe. And, and uh, you know, it just kind of, I guess, you know, well, here we were. everybody's heart. Here we were. The preached word confirmed by signs and wonders. A spiritual gift of tongues, confirmed by the vision. Three ways God spoke to us that night. From that night on, the leadership of the church and I never doubted for a moment what we were to do. And so we just set our sail and we started. If people were offended, God would have to take care of that. We set our sail and started to go. And that's basically why we are where we are today. But you said something about this. Bit. You saw it in your head. What, what, is that? what, do you, what does that mean? Well... <clears throat> You know, we go back far enough in time, we all had to learn these things. I Just so that you know this, I grew up within the church. My father worked for Moody Bible Institute. I've been a Christian since the age of four. When we back, We're talking back in the 70s now. I, when yeah. we moved here, Joe began to introduce me to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I didn't know what that was. And I, I kind of had some serious doubts about it. You know, those are back in the early 70s. Um, but I remember one day he prayed for me, and um, that night I had a visitation from the Lord, which is, probably isn't important here, but I, at that point I knew this stuff was real. But the thing that was unusual is that I really didn't know a whole lot about really hearing the voice of God. And so Herman was, was trying to teach us these things, and it was a brand new world for us, and I didn't know what this meant. 
And I think when I look back at this, you know, at the early days when my, all of our friends, we would try to hear the voice of God, we were, we were kind of, we were excited on one hand, but then we were frightened on the other. Because the thought that entered our mind is that, well, how do we know it's God? How do we know it's not the devil trying to deceive us? And, you know, we became kind of paralyzed because I think we had more faith in the devil deceiving us than we did in God being able to lead us. And it took us a while to begin to understand that, you know, we're redeemed people and, and God is on our side. And, and, uh, but we, we all go through that. When I've talked to other Christians that are begin, trying to walk in this, that's always the fear. How do I know I'm not being deceived? Well, um, you know, if you're being deceived, I guess it'll manifest itself and everything falling apart. But I don't think that's the way God works. And when you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, Jesus said, as a, you know, if you ask me for a, um, a loaf of bread, am I going to, you know, give you a rock? And we ask good things of the Father, and he's going to give us those things. So what we did in the early days is we were meeting in kind of home churches. And since we didn't know much about this, we said, you know, let's practice this stuff. Now, it's one thing to be in a church, and we were all learning this together. There were those people who bought into it and those that didn't. It, it takes, I don't know. It's not easy to, to stand up and say, the Lord is showing me this. I mean, I've heard people say all the time, the Lord, you know, uh, you know, told me this and told me that. And I want to ask him, well, you know, how did he tell it to you? You know, that's the real question. Um, but so we decided to try to figure this out. So what we would do is we'd get together in groups and we would choose something that we needed to pray about. Maybe as a direction for somebody in our group. Uh, maybe it was something that was coming up that we just didn't have any clarity about. Uh, maybe it was a person that had a private problem in our group. Okay? So what we do is we would gather around them, and we, we, we had these kind of ground rules. This is a safe place, we said. It's okay to make a mistake. So we would close our eyes, and we'd begin to just wait, and we just listen. And sometimes someone would get a thought, and sometimes somebody would get a picture. Um, it was something. But then at, at the end of maybe five minutes or so, we'd begin to share. We'd say, okay, what did you see? And we'd go around the room, and, you know, it was interesting. About 70% of the things that were said somehow dovetailed into one another. And, oh, my gosh, you mean that little insignificant thing that I heard over here that didn't make any sense to me, but now that you say this over here, that fits in perfectly with that. And we began to discover, my goodness, this thing is, there's something here. And so that's kind of how we began this thing. Let me give an illustration of that. Um, <clears throat> we... In the old system that we had, we had uh, Sunday school classes. And the adult Sunday school classes, there were four of them, were of various age groups, and they were basically the social structure of the church, and they had officers and everything, and they had monthly socials, as well as having their Sunday school class. And at one particular time, three of the four Sunday school teachers had, we had to replace. They were moving out of town or sick or something. Normally, we would have gotten the board together and we would have said, okay, we have to find some Sunday school teachers. This time we came together and somebody said, well, let's pray about this. Let's see what God has to say. So I said, okay, let's do that because we were in the mode of doing this. And so we began to pray. We prayed for a while and then we came to share. And one person said, you know, what I saw was one person standing in front of a whole big group and it was like there was a halo around them and it was like they, they were especially anointed for this and others said things that kind of corroborated that in my spirit I said no way this is anybody knows from group dynamics and you don't you, you have to keep people separated in smaller groups and you aren't going to get anywhere like that so I just threw that out the next night we had a, another group of people who were coming together in my, church, in my house for another purpose, and they were some of the most mature people in the church that were walking in the Spirit. And so before we started what we had to do, I said to them, you know, I'd like you to just listen with me for a little while, and I'm not even going to tell you what it is. Let's just see if God says anything to us. So we started listening, and, uh, and Somebody said, I think that what we're asking God about is a Sunday school. And somebody else out said, yeah. And you know what I see? I see somebody, I see a whole big class together. And I see one person, you know, it's kind of like anointed to be over this class. And I said, all right, Lord, I give up. I surrender. Uh, because that's what the Lord was saying. It was the farthest thing from my mind that we would have done. But for four or five years, we had one big class together. And this was the guy that taught it. 
And God came down and he instructed us and he led us along. And I was only 24. That was pretty risky business. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell about this seeing. How, how You say you don't see in your head. You do see in your head. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, I work with a lot of young adults within our church. And one of the things that I, I, these young adults really want to know is how do you hear the voice of God? You know, I mean, they, they rely on the people that are mature, like pastors or some of the elders or people that have been around a long time. And they'll, they'll trust those words, but they don't know how to get it for themselves. And so they're very, but they're very interested. They really want to understand these things. So what we've done and in, in, um, when we, we met with these kids is we made, first of all, we made a safe place for them. And then we began to explain what it was like. Because, you know, I used to think that people had said, you know, God showed me this or God told me that. I just figured that there was some kind of supernatural event that happened that was so clear, like they actually saw something, you know, like a vision that was actually out there. But that isn't the way it works at all. For, you know, 99% of us, it is something that is almost like a whisper. Uh, my daughter wrote me about a month, about two months ago, this thing. And she said, I'm as I'm learning to listen for God, it's like, it's like a whisper that I can miss very, very easily. And that's really the truth. That's, that's what really goes on here. It's like a whisper. But the pictures that I get in my head, now I'm a visionary guy, so not everybody gets things like this. Um, <clears throat> but I'm on a prayer team. And so what will happen? Well, people come forward on Sunday morning and they want prayer. And a lot of times I don't know these people from a hole in a wall. And they're standing in front of me and they're telling me something and I, and I don't have any clue how to answer them. And so I say, well, let's just ask God. And so, and I tell them, just, we're just going to not say anything for a minute, a minute, you know. Don't get panicky. I haven't forgotten you. We just need to hear. So uh, my wife and I pray together and I close my eyes and then I just, I'm dependent on God at this point because I don't know how to pray. And what will happen is I just, I sit there and then all of a sudden, there'll be a picture. Now, if you're like me, you can close your eyes and you can get all kinds of pictures, you know. Um, you can sit down, oh, there's a, you know, <laughs> there's a red wagon. Oh, there's a little girl jumping in a red wagon. Oh, there comes a pony. You know, you get all these kind of random things that kind of flow in your head. So we have to be careful. But what happens with me is I'll get these pictures and it's like, okay, this doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. But all of a sudden, there will be something. It'll be a picture that I think to myself, oh, okay, where did this come from? Because I, was, I wasn't thinking about this. And then I pay attention, and I watch this picture, and the picture just begins to unfold. Now, what does it look like? Well, I'll show you exactly what it looks like. Close your eyes. Everybody, close your eyes. Imagine an ice cream cone. Now, can you see it in your head? That's what it looks like. <laughs> just like that. It's just like that. It's just, it's like you imagine an ice cream cone and there it is. But in my case, they're kind of rolling pictures. Now, my wife, she gets kind of a similar thing. And sometimes I'll only get a part, a part of something. And so I'll say, well, I don't understand this. And then I'll begin to pray something. And then as I begin to pray it, it's like all of a sudden the camera starts to roll some more and I can continue on. Um, and what is interesting is I have learned lately when I pray for people to keep my eyes open very often because you'll know when it's the Spirit of God because all of a sudden something changes in them. Their face changes. They, their body just goes limp. I mean, there's something that happens. They begin to weep. And you know you're on target. It really gives you confidence. Um, but over time, you just are able to discern. And, you know, I'm still learning. I'm still learning, but I've, I've, I've learned not to be fearful at all anymore of false voices. I mean, that really is the truth. Mm -hmm. So we just make a safe place, and the question is, how, you know, what's it look like? Well, it's very simple, but you need to have a safe place to start out, and it's okay to fail. Okay, so you started training some of the young adults in our church. Okay, just quickly tell, what was the outcome of that? Where did they get to in that? Well, they're all, well, first of all, they were surprised. They were surprised that they could do this. Um, and, and I, you know, I just really, really encourage them to, to pay attention to the random thoughts that come into their mind that kind of surprise them. That's kind of the thing. It's like it's a little bit of a surprise. And like if, you, if one of you gave me a problem or came up with me and said, this is my situation with my daughter. What should I do? You know, and you give me this stuff. Well, I can logically think of what to do, what I would do. That doesn't mean that's what God would do. So if that's what I begin to give you, I'm pretty sure it's not God. And so what happens is as I'm waiting for these things, generally the idea that comes or the picture that comes usually surprises me. And I say, oh, 
where did this come from? I hadn't even thought of that. Then you can pretty much be sure mm-hmm. that's probably God beginning to say something to you. You see, so I'm, I'm learning not to trust my own mind. And now, because I am married and because my wife, um, we are one, that when we pray together, we are a check and balance to each other. Mm-hmm. And I can start something, and she'll just all of a sudden give me a nudge, and I'll know that she, that she has picked up she has picked up the picture that I started, and she's got the rest of the story. And I and so you know we got these little signals, and sure enough, and then she'll start to do something, and then all of a sudden I'll see another picture that's relating to what she's saying, and I'll give her a nudge, and then she stops, and then I go on, and it's like tag team. Mm-hmm. But with the kids. What they do is we just gave them a safe place and they would experiment and they would discover that everything they said, see, God, God wants you to learn this. This is what you have to understand. He wants you to learn this. So it's like God's favor seems to be in groups that really are trying to learn to hear his voice. And so what happens is about 90, 95% of the things that you guys will start to get will be God because he wants you to learn how to do this stuff. And you'll get the individual thing that doesn't make sense. But because there's five other people getting things, in the end, it all makes sense. And not only that, sometimes it can have a real breakthrough for the person you're praying for. And it's amazing. And you do this three or four times, and your excitement level just really grows. And so what happened is our young people now, when we would get together, you know, they thought nothing when we prayed for anything. When something came to the mind, they just shared it, you know. And, you know... It, it's such confidence builders because they realize, hey, God wants to talk to me, hmm. you know, and, I, and just stop being afraid of the devil. You, you don't belong to him anymore. He doesn't have any right to you. He has no legal mm-hmm. access to you unless you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. And so, therefore, God is going to be planting these things in you. You just need to relax a little bit, but find a safe place. And then once you get confident, you're off and running. There are three dangers that we have to avoid if we're, as we're trying to hear. The first is that Anything that will not hear anything unless it comes in the way we're used to hearing, well, Gary has exploded that. I mean, how many of you have, have seen all these, have seen movies like he does in his head, and that's God speaking? I haven't, but I'm, well, I'm open to it. It's okay. Second thing is that everything we think is, we're hearing or seeing is from God. That's also a danger because... Many times our own flesh gets mixed in or there are other reasons. Not bad, but we just can't assume that everything that comes is from God. And then what Gary just mentioned, uh, the third danger is the fear that we'll make a mistake. When my little daughter learned to walk, the first time she took two steps and fell on her face. I didn't go over and spank her and said, you naughty girl, you're supposed to walk. I said, look at my good big girl. She took two steps, but I picked her up and encouraged her, and tried, we tried again. That's often the way it is, as God's teaching us. Uh, Nathan, the prophet Nathan, one day came to David, and um, he said, David, God told me that you can build this wonderful house for him that you want to build, the temple. And uh, he went home, and David was uh, rejoicing, and God apprehended Nathan and said, I didn't say that, Nathan. And so Nathan had to crawl back to David the next day with egg on his face and say, oh, God really didn't say that. I thought he did, but he didn't. It's your son that's going to build it. And then for these reasons, well, David didn't lift his head. David didn't fire him on the spot. David realized that, you know, there's a process here in learning how to do this. And uh, so I like Psalm 37 there at the bottom of the page. It says, The steps of a good man are directed by the Lord. He delights in each step they take. If they fall, it isn't fatal, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Now, in this whole process of hearing the word of God, like Gary has been describing it, we have to be free enough so that God can speak in any way he desires to us, and we have to be willing to risk for him to speak. So, Here's the steps that we suggest, and you can just quickly write these down. First of all, we claim the Holy Spirit's protection, keeping us from any deceitful word. And uh, the secondly, we listen lightly. That's what Gary was saying. Don't be so, make this so serious and be so concerned that you wouldn't dare say this and this. I think maybe, oh, I saw this or I did that. And you think, what a fool I'll be, or that certainly isn't God. Well, if you listen lightly, it doesn't matter. You're not going to, nobody's going to think badly of you. You just 
everybody's sharing kind of what they received. And thirdly, it, the, this listing can be accomplished best in groups where we're of one mind, we're seeking the Lord. That's what Gary was sharing with us about as far as the young adults are concerned just recently. And we had, we've done so much of this in the past of our church. And not only that, but the, number four is so important. We must test whatever comes as we listen. And the way we test it is uh, we, com- we see what, what God is doing and saying in the group, and maybe it fits in and maybe it doesn't. If it doesn't, we let it fall. Or it becomes apparent as we bring this to the pastor, we bring it to a spiritual authority in the church, and we lay it before them, and and they have discernment from God that, you know, maybe some of this is God's will for you, but I'm not so sure about this. Okay, so we pay attention to that. And sometimes we have to let, let parts of what we think God may be saying fall through the cracks. We have to test it. This is so important especially when it comes to giving personal prophecies. In other words, as the Spirit moves in the supernatural manifestations, you're praying for somebody, it will seem that the Lord is giving you a word for them. And when you bring that word to them, don't do it pontifically like you are God himself. Don't say, now God is telling you Or, thus saith the Lord. I mean, supposing they don't feel good in their spirit about that. Are they going to argue with God? You're God. Well, you said you were. So, how much better it is to say in a humble way. You know, the thing that's being impressed in my heart is this. Now, you see if this, your, your heart confirms this. And then you give the word. If you receive a word, don't just run out and act on it. Make sure it settles well in your spirit. I like to encourage people to make sure there's three confirmations of something they feel that God is saying to them before they go out and do it. Just like there were three confirmations that day when our church really turned around and started off following the cloud. Make sure that there's three confirmations. And then lastly, you can write in your notes, there will be things you don't understand. So it's like eating fish. You don't throw the fish out. You lay the bones aside. You go on with the good meat, right? And many times you'll lay things aside because they're not clear. And maybe you'll keep praying about it or a month, a year, two years later. Here it is. I could give you illustrations of that too, but we're running out of time. Uh, Everything that Jesus came to the Father for, he received. You know why? Because he had heard from the Father beforehand that this was the will of the, this was God's will. You pray in God's will. You find out from God what He wants to do, and it's like getting up there in that jet stream if you're on an airliner, and you get there an hour ahead of schedule because you're being carried along in that stream. And this is what God's doing today. What He wants to do today, and I want to tell you the little beginning nibbles that some of us are experiencing of hearing God's voice, which are helpful in enriching our lives, I want to tell you that that's nothing compared to what God wants to do. Gary, tell Darren's story. My son is uh, in the process of filming. Actually, a year and a half ago, he had an angelic visitation, literally. My son was very skeptical about all this stuff that I and my wife were walking in. He didn't disagree, but whatever. He just wasn't quite sure. But he had an angelic visitation, and he felt the hands of the angel put, his, put the hands on his face and said to my son, Darren, this movie that you're contemplating, do it, do it, do it. Right now, it is urgent. God is requiring this of you. Make this movie. So for the last year and a half, he's been going all over the world filming the miracles of God and the things that God is doing all over the world and interviewing these people, and it's amazing. Well, just uh, one of the last people he visited was a fellow... Uh, in Connecticut, and they said, man, you got to go see this kid. His name is J- Jason Westerfield. He's only 31 years old. And he says, but God is on this guy. So Darren goes over there, and he's filming this fellow. He's on, in the middle of Yale campus, and Jason's on prostrate, you know, right in the middle of the campus. He's just praying. You know, people are laughing at him, and they're, you know, the, all the Chinese are taking pictures and the Korean students. But at any rate, so anyhow, he, he gets, when he gets up, he says, Darren, he says, um, 
God has given us favor in a four square block area around Yale campus right here. And anything we ask of God, God will do. If we see somebody with a, that's crippled, says we pray for them, God's going to heal them. And Darren said, well, how do you know that? And he says, um, he said, Darren, would you like to see into the supernatural? And he said, well, yeah. You know, Darren's never done anything like this. He says, okay, take off your glasses. So Darren took off his glasses, and Jason went over, put his hands over his eyes like that, and he said, God, show him what I see. And he took his hand away, and Darren says, oh, my gosh, what the heck is that? You know, real spiritual. And he's looking up in the sky, and in the sky, in a four-block radius, there's fireworks going off. He says it was like sparklers and lightning and, and, and flashes of, of, of light. And, and I said, now, Darren, when you're seeing this, is this something you're seeing inside your head? And he said, no, Dad. It was as physical as you. He says, I've never seen anything like it in my life. And so, and, uh, so Darren said, what is that? And he said, well, that's God's, that's God's presence. You know, this is how I know we can, we can pray for anything. He said, hey, Darren, if you think that, that's cool, looking back at you. So Darren turns around, and between these two buildings on the Yale campus, there is this immense cloud of gold that's swirling in, in, up in the air, and there's lightning bolts going through this thing. And Darren said, what is that? And he says, that's the glory of God. It's coming. And then all of a sudden, the crippled guy, or not a, a guy on a, on a crutch, came, came walking right past there, and, and Jason left, and he ran over this guy, and he says, hey, can I, can I pray with you? You know, this, he was kind of a gangbanger, and the guy kind of looked at him, and he said, what? And he says, yeah, he says, yeah, I, I, think, I think God wants to heal you. So he begins to pray for this kid, and right then and there, he's healed. Of course, Darren got in back of the camera, started photographing these things, and then after that, all the things were gone. He didn't see him again. But that was a real thing that, that happened. And I just need to say this. We need to learn to hear what God is saying. And the thought of my mind is this, is that God is always speaking to us, but if we're always looking backwards and we don't, we're not keeping current what God, what, with what God is doing, we're going to miss some major things. And I, and I love the idea of this. If Abraham, you remember, God told Abraham to kill his son. If Abraham hadn't stayed current with God, Isaac would be dead. You see, just because God said it then doesn't mean that God can't be right there to say something now. And if he hadn't been listening to him, we got a dead Isaac. But you see, Abraham continued to listen to God. God is a river. He's not a lake. He's on the move. And the, the, the church needs to wake up. That we, This is something that we desperately need. We need to learn to hear the voice of God. If Jesus said, you will do the same things I do, and if Jesus said, I only do what the Father shows me, where do we think, how can we do better than that? We shouldn't be doing things unless God shows us. Well, how does God show us? We have to spend time with him. You know, so how do you develop a relationship with God? You develop a relationship with God. <laughs> that just means you do it, okay? Amen. Isn't, isn't it amazing to think what God has for us if we only begin to learn how to hear what he's saying to us? Lord, we just ask you to whet our appetites, create a hunger and thirst within us, uh, Lord, we know that this spiritual revelation is nothing we can do ourselves, and it isn't something our mind can do, but it's something that you will do within us as we allow you. Lord, I pray that you will begin to teach each one here in the sound of our voice to hear your voice, what it sounds like for them, how you speak to them, so that they may begin to grow in the things that you have for them. We just commit ourselves to you for this purpose, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.